Thank you for having me. It's a great event. Certainly not <clears throat> a moment overdue. Um, I graduated from Florence, 100 kilometers away, 60 miles. And yet, I didn't know the Georgie nor of the Georgie. And I discovered him later. And uh, when I discovered him, he affected, I would say, also imprinted a large part of my scientific life, uh, even, on, even if I never met him. Uh, I saw him physically only once. And um, so this is sort of a testimonial how his work reached also people that were not close to him physically here in Pisa. Um, there is this biography of the Georgie, which is on the shelves and the tables here outside, and um, that says um, of his vision, uh, the contribution of his students in picking up his visionary ideas. I'd like to spend a moment on another aspect, however, so I met the Georgie through this uh, celebrated paper of um, the, the analyticity of minima uh, of integrals, or variational integrals. And you know, my formal training was in free boundaries, and you soon realize that several free boundary problems do translate into PDEs with measurable coefficients. So I asked somebody, um, how do you prove that? And they directed me to the Georgie's paper. So the other aspect I've tried, I like to point out is, uh, is incredible depth uh, mathematical skills. Uh, the in depth in, in, in actually doing calculation, doing computations. And we sort of sometimes we sort of try to shy away from technicalities. It, it certainly did not. You know, his, uh, his vision was paired by an unpaired, uh, unpaired um, technical skills. Um, this, he was most, of, most like, sort of like a mathematical proof of what one of my great teachers of mine told me one day, and that's Carlo Pucci, he said, don't never be afraid of doing calculations. In fact, any good idea has got to have its own proper technical language to be expressed with. And certainly, the Georgie was that. He was a philosopher at heart and a craftsman in real life. So I'm happy to be part of this tribute to him. What I have to say, so another thing that's uh, that's in that biography is that there's an observation, it's a remark along the lines of the Georgie liked to think more in terms of functionals than partial differential equations. What I have to say today is along those lines, and there's a tiny progress on an old problem. Let's see if I learn now too. And this to do with the issue of boundary continuity for minima of variational integrals. So let me start with simple definitions, which are unknown to all of us. So we take a carriatory function and the functional, and we define in the obvious way a Q minimum, and we could define sub and super Q minima by the signum of the test function phi. Now, suppose a quasi-minimum takes some boundary values um, and the boundary of some domain E with smoothness I'm not specifying at the moment. Um, the issue is, under what condition on the boundary the datum is taken in the classical sense, and that is in the sense of continuous function. This is an old issue. It goes back to two centuries ago for harmonic function, and the first condition you might remember was the, uh, the exterior sphere condition at the point. 
And then uh, Lebesgue produced this celebrated theorem by which uh, irregularities of the of, um, lack of continuity of harmonic functions to the boundary might occur in the presence of cusps. And then Wiener took over. And the history is there. Um, it's an illustrative history. Uh, Stampachia, Weinberger, Stampachia is also another Pisa product or Pisa uh, element of proud, pride. Um, and then other peoples like Masia, a um, number of people in uh, potential theory. The point is that in all the contributions to date, the equation plays a crucial role. All proofs, all approaches that do use the strength of having a partial differential equation. On the other end, Minimizing a function means minimizing an energy. You might and might not have a PDE associated with it. You might not have the Euler equation associated with it. Nevertheless, you're minimizing some physical quantity. So what is it that it's forcing the boundary to have some condition for continuity up to the boundary to be taken? Is it a PDE? or is actually a minimization process. So the issue has been, was raised in the early 80s by a number of people, and um, there are only very few results. I mentioned them as I go along, and um, that's what I want to attack. So let me state the result first, and then I'll make some more comments and give you the full proof of uh, what I'm about to say. So we take a a point <coughs> on the boundary of the domain, let's say, say the origin, up to a translation, P is between 1 and N, and we define the P capacity in the usual way. Um, we look at the complement about a ball or radius rho of the domain E, and uh, we define capacity as the infimum of all the W01 RN continuous functions, which exceed or equal one on that little piece of the complement. Uh, one computes the capacity of a ball is essentially rho to the N minus P. And uh, the normalized capacity or relative capacity, in fact, is the capacity defined up there. Let's see if I can. There, the capacity divided the capacity of a ball. Uh, if equal n, the definition is a bit different. Um, we look at the, a set, and we look at the capacity with respect to a ball ca that contains it. So that be a ball of radius two or whatever. The point is we're limiting the class of functions where the minimum is being taken. Otherwise, if you leave them free as up there, you get zero all the time. And, uh, and the capacity of a ball is of the order of a constant, so capacity and relative capacity coincide for P equal N. In the stock, to avoid uh, uh, proliferation of symbolism, uh, I'll take P between 1 and N, so that's the object I'll be considering. The Wiener integral for a parameter epsilon is the following quantity. You take the relative capacity relative to a ball of radius rho. That's what we call delta in the previous slide integrate from rho to 1, say near the origin, of this uh, uh, Hilbert transform type integral. And uh, we call that uh, Wiener integral relative to a point um, on the boundary. And this got nothing to do with partial differential equation. That's a geometrical issue. Just give me a domain, pick a point, look at the capacity of the complement nearby, and that number can be computed. Theorem I'm about to 
proof for you is, says the following. Take a quasi minimum, so no PDEs around, and uh, a datum G, which is continuous, is taken in the classical sense for a certain parameter epsilon if the Wiener integral diverges. So let me say this. Uh, this is a statement of continuity. So that's the Wiener integral. Take the functional, take your minimum, take the boundary, take data, and those are continuous. Look at the essential oscillation, actually the oscillation of the boundary data, those are continuous. And take the maximum between the oscillation of u with a ball of radius one times the exponential of minus the Wiener integral. The theorem says that the essential oscillation of u in any lesser ball is bounded by this quantity. Now, this is going to go to zero as rho goes to zero because g is continuous. And this is going to go to zero if the Wiener integral diverges. So that's what the theorem says. If the Wiener integral for some epsilon, or there is an epsilon which can be quantified, diverges, oops, I need to. If it diverges, then the boundary datum is taken in the sense of continuous function irrespective of whether you have a partial differential equation or not. You may have just a function. And if p is equal to n, that's a triviality we don't need to. So let me go back before. I'll prove the theorem in great detail. Um, but let me give you some background of where this issue comes from and what are the preceding uh, results. So I'm starting by looking at, again, at the definition of relative capacity, that's delta, at the Wiener integral. And uh, if epsilon is 1 and u is an harmonic function, a minimum in particular, then the theorem is a Wiener's theorem. In fact, it's a criterion. It's an if and only if criterion. And there was Wiener's response to Lebesgue issue, actually, celebrated theorem. Now, for quasi-linear equations with p growth, um, the issue arose after Wiener um, result, whether there was an issue of the Laplacian or an issue of elliptic partial differential equations. And this issue was taken up by several people, Littmann, Stampaki, and Weinberger. They looked at linear equations with measurable coefficients. And they showed, again, that for epsilon equal 1, if the Wiener integral is defined with the epsilon equal 1, then you have continuity up to the boundary uh, if that integral diverges. For Quasi-linear equations with peak growth, the issue was taken by Masia, and Garipi, and Zimmer. Um, it's an old issue, as I, must, uh, as, I, as I was mentioning. And the epsilon that yielded continuity, provided the integral, the Wiener integral diverges, is precisely p minus 1. So if p is 2, case of harmonic function, you recover the classical results. The point of all these contributions is that the equation is essential. One way or another, in an overt or less overt way, the maximum principle comes in. And maximum principle, even comparison principle, it's not known to hold for quasi minima. Or the richness of a PDE is that you can take lots of test functions and create inequalities for. Uh, the solutions of PDE or even the reciprocal. That's one of the approaches of Garap and Zimmer. Here, we don't have any of the machinery to work with. The only result to date I know 
is of Zimmer that goes back to AD 6. As I mentioned, this is an old issue with very few results. And uh, Zimmer showed that uh, if the Wiener integral diverges in an exponential way, that is, rather than having the delta to a certain power, if the divergence occurs exponentially, then you have continuity of the boundary data being taken in the classical sense. And that's all that's known. So the novelty of what I'm about to prove is that we are replacing an exponential divergence of the Wiener integral with a power. I would love to have the power to be p minus 1, but we don't have it yet. So this is a partial result to that issue. So let's go for the proof. Um, the, let me list the tools needed in proving the theorem, and then I'll put them together. Um, so we have a Q sub minimum, our functional, um, nearby in a ball, in a little piece of E, really, that these are issues are local. And suppose the U vanishes on the boundary. Um, then there is a constant so that the energy inequality holds for U. Um, anyone working on part elliptic partial differential equations says that this is a trivial estimate if you had a PDE, multiplied by U and integrate by parts. That's all there is. Nevertheless, if you're working with functionals, even very basic energy integrals are not guaranteed. In fact, there is quite a bit of labor in deriving an inequality of this kind. Now, the point is that the test function phi vanishes on the boundary of the ball, but need not to vanish on the boundary of the domain E. The vanishing of the band and the boundary of the domain E is taken up by the U. And the proof of Tolksdorf, again, 86 is quite a bit, essentially goes like this. Write down your functional. These are the constants of the Cariatori function you look at. And the place of your test function, you put u phi, where phi doesn't vanish on the boundary of E, but u does. So the vanishing of the boundary is taken up by this product. And then crudely, you really don't get an energy inequality. This goes like grad u to the p. This also goes, goes grad u to the p. The labor is in taking this term and absorbing it back into the left-hand side. Um, this is a published result, so I'm not going to go into the proof of that. But here are some consequences. So consequences are rather simple. Uh, you can add a constant and still maintain the minimality. So in the place of u, you put any h, non-negative, and the inequality is preserved because we're adding something. And uh, this, as simple as it is, gives us some freedom to play with the parameter h. Here's the second ingredient of the proof, and that's a weak Arnach inequality for non-negative Q sub minima. Goes back to Trudinger, and I worked with him at that time. Here's what it says. Take a point, say the origin and the boundary, a function V, non-negative, and satisfying the lower truncations, the energy produced by the lower truncations are bounded 
by the lower truncations in a homogeneous way. Homogeneous means that this is a right radius scaling factor. This is P and this is P. There is nothing to do here with PDEs or Wiener criteria. This is a factor of its own. And suppose this happens for all balls inside the bigger one. And for all the case, let's concentrate on all case where the H they came in the previous slide will come in. Freedom of taking all the case. And for constants which are independent of all the ingredients. Then there is a constant which you can determine in terms of all these components, all these ingredients or constants or parameters, so that the integral average of a small power of V, properly homogenized, one over epsilon, is bounded by the infimum up to a constant of V in a ball of radius rho. This is known as the weak Carnegie inequality, known for uh, non-negative solutions of elliptic equations, linear or non-linear, quasi-linear. The result actually is a bit more general, and it's related to the George's classes. So let me connect back to the main theme of this meeting. So let me make a digression on the Zarnak inequality and the Georgi classes. Uh, let me, let's take a function, V, non-negative. Oh, it doesn't have to, yeah, non-negative. And take the upper and lower truncations. And suppose those truncations have an energy which is bounded by their LP norm, positively or negative, again, with the proper homogeneity. Um, a function that satisfies that, wherever it comes from, is called to be a function in the, the Georgi classes. And this is to happen for all the balls nearby an environment you're within, like a ball of radius to row. <clears throat> then, soup and inf are related by the Arnak inequality. The soup is less than the inf up to a certain constant. You have to shrink the environment you, where you're working with. You go to a ball of radius rho, starting from a larger one. And that's a fact known for elliptic, or linear and quasi-linear um, equations. But it works for functions under the Georgi classes only. Uh, that's a surprising fact. There is no partial differential equation coming in at all. Um, before I go to the proof of the theorem, which comes uh, next, so I'm going to be using only the weak version of this inequality. Let me say, make one comment about these classes. I think, it's my opinion, that these classes have not been systematically used and studied mostly as they deserve to be. Um, the Georgia used only those inequalities to prove that functions satisfy those objects are actually older continuous, independently of the, where they come from. Um, it's known that, <clears throat> that convex increasing functions of uh, they are in the De Georgi classes remain in the De Georgi classes. This is sort of an equivalent to sub and sub-solutions of an elliptic equation. Um, it's known, for example, that if u is in a De Georgi class, uh, the log u is in BMO, another unexpected fact. If u is in a De Georgi class, then the rate of degrees or the measure of its um, um, it's a um, distribution function, say the set where u is bigger than t. How does it decrease as t goes to infinity, for example? It has a very specific rate of decrease in terms of the level. These are little niblets of what's known about those 
those objects, and I wish there would be a more systematic study of, um, of those objects. Here's an example. Uh, Moser did show uh, that um, the non-negative solutions of um, linear, because the linear is the same, really, elliptic equations are in BMO. In fact, that's almost a triviality. Just take one over u as a, as a test function, and, the P, and that's it. Whereas, for, and that actually was instrumental in proving the Arnak inequality. Whereas, for functions in the De Georgi classes, you need the knowledge of the Arnak inequality to establish that actually log u is in BMO. So you see, there are a lot of issues. What's more important? What's really crafting the structure of these classes? And so it's, uh, I don't think they've been studied systematically, and then just let me say this. Let's go back to our issue. And um, I'll be able to prove the result in reasonable detail. So let me start with some notation. Um, take a ball of radius rho, intersect it with uh, the domain, and take the soup and the if, essential soup and essential if, and the essential oscillation. And the boundary datum is continuous. Then let's compare the soup and the inf for the boundary data to the soup and the inf on my quasar minimum, perturbed a bit by a bit of the oscillation. Okay, so something which is slightly less than the soup and something which is slightly more than the inf. I claim that at least one of these two inequalities got to be true. In fact, if both are false, Inter change the sign, change the sign, multiply by minus one, get back the right sign, add them up, you get that the oscillation is bounded by the soup, the factor half comes from this one fourth in the oscillation, soup for G minus the in for G, which is the oscillation of G and the boundary. So there is nothing to prove. So at least one of these inequalities got to be satisfied. So let me take, for example, the first to be true. So if u exceeds this quantity, which in turn exceeds the soup of the boundary data, then the part of u where u is above this object it's going to be, it's, it's going to not, going to be, not going to be there on the boundary. Because this object is, exceeds the soup of the boundary datum. So the soup of the boundary data is less than this thing. So at the boundary, this thing is less than this object, so this positive part is going to be zero. A fortiori, if you take away a little niblet to positive quantity. And you want to make sure that this is uh, a niblet that remains negative, because otherwise it's not really clear that this will be zero at the boundary. And this means a k should be between zero and one. It's a rather undoing function. Let's renormalize it by dividing by the factor of fourth of the oscillation throughout and calling W that um, renormalization. So the object I had before after the normalization is a W minus a little bit, this is zero at the boundary, minus a little bit at the boundary keeps remaining zero. Uh, one verifies that actually W is between zero. Positivity is trivial, and U is less than the soup, so the old thing is less than one. And it vanishes on the boundary, and it continues to be a sub-minimum. Now we apply Tolksdorf result. So 
So this object satisfies essentially an energy inequality. It vanishes on the boundary. A phi need not vanish on the boundary. And this is true for all the case between 0 and 1 for reasons I mentioned. And the integration is done over the ball intersect the domain we we're working on. Little trick, remember the H parameter I mentioned before. We can add it there. And the effect is that actually the previous inequality that did, did hold for k between 0 and 1, if you can add any positive h, can hold for any k, not necessarily between 0 and 1. Trivial shift, really, but it will be uh, full of consequences. So this can be taken as being true for all the k's, for the reason I mentioned. So shift a bit the algebra. W minus 1 minus k, you call it 1 minus w. And the positive part of this object is the same as the negative part of this shifted function. And now you see we are back in the situation where the weak Carnac inequality can be applied. I've just rewritten exactly what I told you in words, because 1 minus w, we call the v. So here's what the Arnak inequality, weak Arnak inequality looks like, and here what the consequences are. Let me go back. I know it's hard to read between the various transformations, but let's, let me try to do my best. So the V is the one to which the Arnak inequality holds. So this means V to the epsilon integral 1 over epsilon is bounded by the infimum. I'm keeping the ep 1 over epsilon outside for the moment. So that's the weak Arnak inequality. And now let me go back to the variables I was working with. V it's 1 minus W. 1 minus W is the complicated expression that came from the renormalization of the U. Oops. I'm sorry. I need to get used to this pointer. So you do some algebra. Eliminate this term. The denominator remains. This will look like the soup minus u to the power epsilon. And the infimum is realized whenever this object is the supremum. If we find an epsilon for which this is the case, any smaller epsilon will do, and that's essentially all the inequality. The proof is concluded by a lemma. It says, take the V I mentioned before. Um, it's between 0 and 1, non-negative. And take the energy generated by a small power of V. Then this is bounded by a small power of the V up to the proper normalization factors, the homogeneity factors, which are the test functions phi, which essentially cut things off. This is not true for any function, obviously. V, it's relinked to the function I started. Incidentally, in Bowser proof, an estimate of this kind is trivial. And the way it's realized is by taking negative powers of the solution and doing the usual cranking machine. But remember, we have a functional. So no negative power, so you are allowed in the competing functions of the functionals. 
So let me take this lemma as good for the moment, see if I can prove it later on, and let me conclude the proof of the theorem. And uh, we're going to choose a test function which is standard, vanishing outside the ball of radius 2 rho, 1 near the origin, and with a controlled gradient. And uh, let's write back what I had a minute ago. Remember, what we had, had a minute ago was that the energy is bounded by V to the epsilon. Energy bounded by V to the power epsilon. But that's what the V was. And we try to reconstruct back the function by the previous definition. V to the epsilon phi is, was the 1 minus V, which was the rescaled function. Do some algebra. And notice that the left-hand side is a function which is in W1P, zero, non-negative, W vanishes on the boundary, so V is one at the boundary, and one also outside, up to an extension. So this V, it's one of the competing functions that generates the capacity. So this is bounded below by the capacity. The power is the correct one, divide by the power to generate. So let me, let, let, I was going too fast. So this is the capacity, which is less than the infimum. That's the definition of capacity. This object has been majorized by this right-hand side, which we proved is bounded by the difference of the soups with the right power. So if you divide by that, this will be the relative capacity. The relative capacity thus is majorized by the difference of the soups. Difference of soups in a larger ball minus a smaller ball. And I've written there in detail what I just told you in words. And now the theorem is concluded by algebra. Take the one over epsilon power. So this is algebra, one over epsilon power. Take the soup over the ball of radius. First multiply by this denominator so that that's all over. And take the soup on the uh, left hand side, divide by the proper C. So we have realized that the soup has shrunk by a quantity which is um, driven by the delta rho, the relative capacity of the complement of the domain E nearby the point where we're operating. Now, the shrinking is in terms of the soups, but, but it's trivial to show that actually is the, in terms of the oscillation because if you take away from left and right hand side the inf, the inf over b rho is cert it's certainly less than the inf over two, the ball of radius two rho, change the signal, add them up, essentially we have an oscillation decrease. And that's done for, oops, a ball or radius rho, take a decrease in sequence of balls, like going geometrically in some fashion, and call omega sub n the oscillations over those. And you iterate that, and that's a simple thing. It comes with the product of this object for each of the progressive in nested balls. And, uh, and now it's, we look at Wiener that says this product will go to zero 
as n goes to infinity, thus rho n goes to zero, if and only if actually the Wiener integral diverges. So the last line really is a Wiener's line. And thus, um, how, am I, how am I doing with time? Three minutes, okay. Um, just one word about the lemma that needed to be proven. It follows from this proposition. Oh, 10 minutes. Well, then I'll finish early. Then I'll finish early. There'll be more time for, for coffee. <laughs> so here's the lemma that needed to be proven. The proposition says that despite having a functional and not a partial differential equation, you can take negative powers in the energy estimate. Remember, in the Moser type iteration technique, you could take directly negative powers. Here, we, we can't. And here's the starting point. Remember, this is the inequality that did yield the weak Arnach inequality for all positive k's. I want to generate negative powers by looking at the distribution function of the V. So we're going to choose a test function, which is a small positive power of V, and put it back in. This is a crudely uh, rewritten statement of taking V to the sigma phi as a test function. And here's where the distribution function comes in. Since k is positive and arbitrary, we multiply by k to a negative power and then integrate over dk. Now, the integration essentially uh, is done over the set where k is bigger than v. So integrate in dk, interchange the order of integration. And this is really a simple consequence of calculus. We get a nice power on the left-hand side, and the cal final calculation is the one you wanted. The left-hand side is transformed, as I said, that the integral is extended over the v's, over the k's that are bigger than v. And again, do the same calculation. The net result is, that this is the left-hand side, as I mentioned. This is the calculation of the right-hand side. So we're almost there, except for absorbing this term back into the energy integral. And here is a choice of parameters. One is, is to be careful in choosing those parameters, otherwise you lose the negativity of the powers you want there. Um, choose them in a judicious way, and that will prove the lemma. And that's where I end my talk, and thank you for your attention.